Earlier today, Donald Trump sat for a deposition under oath. For now, only a few select people know if Trump actually answered any questions or if he caught another case of, let's call it, forgetfulness. I don't remember that. I don't remember the names. I don't know that I said it. I don't, I don't know. I don't Asked know the answers. answers. I mean, I don't, I don't remember. By the way, that's the guy who once claimed to have the, quote, world's greatest memory. Speaking under oath in 2015 for a deposition about Trump University, that's a case that ended with Trump agreeing to a $25 million settlement. But today, Trump is facing a defamation lawsuit brought by former magazine columnist E. Jean Carroll. Carroll claims that he raped her in the mid-90s, but this case isn't about that alleged assault. It's about comments Trump made about Carroll once she made the accusation. He said he never met her. He said she's totally lying. And he said she wasn't his type. The reality is, even as Trump fights one defamation case, he's weaponizing defamation claims against others, including suing CNN for calling his lies, well, lies. I'm joined now by Ken Turkel, who represented both Sarah Palin and Hulk Hogan in their respective lawsuits against the New York Times for Palin and Gawker for Hulk Hogan. Uh, Ken, thanks so much for being here. Really good appreciate here. it. Good it's to good to here. see you. So Jean Carroll says she plans to sue Trump next month about the sexual assault claims. What are the chances that his answers in the defamation case might be used against him in that case? So you've got this new law up in New York that's reviving statute of limitations. So what's interesting about this, you get these attributes of Me Too cases with the pending defamation case. Five years ago when the Me Too cases were coming, that wasn't as strange, but this is a new vibe. Of course the answers are gonna matter. They're gonna matter for that case, you know, Theoretically, if there was ever a criminal investigation, they'd matter for that. In other words, if it was fresh and you were alleging rape and the police were involved, you would take five on that all day. Yeah. So yeah, of course they matter. I'm not sure that there's any real strategy not to answer them in the context of two civil cases. Right, I would imagine that he just denied that he, that he, he didn't have a case of amnesia, that he actually said, no, it didn't happen, it didn't happen, it didn't happen. I, I can't think of anything else that make, would make sense, but you're the lawyer, tell me. He's kind of all in on this one, in the sense that the public comments he made on social, put it, it's a very he said, she said thing, I never knew her. Right. That's a hard one to get away from, right? Right. If you qualify something, you may have a little wiggle room, a memory loss thing, or I confused. But when you say I never knew her in the context of the accusations being made, you are playing a zero sum, he said, she said, credibility game to a jury. So. We're in an era now where there's a, it's, it seems like there's a lot of defamation cases in the, in the media. Johnny Depp and Amber uh, Heard's divorce ended up with back and forth dem defamation claims. Uh, Black China lost her five year fight against the Kardashians over a canceled reality show. W why do we seem to be in this new era of high profile defamation cases? It's a great question. It's a question I am answering literally every week now somewhere. Um, let, let's, I, I was just talking to Laura about this. I was on her show a few times talking about Depp Heard, talking about Alex Jones. Let's pull away first and say, are they defamation cases? Because my position on Depp Heard was that it wasn't really a defamation case. It was like counter allegations of domestic violence. Right. Um, you didn't really hear talks about speech, about public figure standards or provable falsity. You just had all this kind of mudslinging. Right. Alex Jones took a default judgment on both cases, Texas and Connecticut meaning liability was not an issue. We weren't discussing First Amendment parameters, principles. Uh, there wasn't a hard dive on it. So are those really speech cases, all right? We call them speech cases because we know that that's what was the genesis of the claim. The issue, though, of why they're going to trial to me is the more fascinating one. And what I'm seeing, I'm grassroots level. This is what I do. Yeah. Palin was a speech case. I mean, right. we were deep dive on actual malice deep dive on basic First Amendment principles there, motion practice, appeals, reversals. I think, and this is just gut feeling grassroots level, the judges are seeing more and more of what technology is doing in that arena. Speech, oh, privacy, the interrelationship. And so what's happening is they're putting, Jacob was unheard of 20 years to try this many speech cases. I think the New York Times hadn't had to try a libel case, jury try one in something like 28 years before we tried Palin, all right? You've seen four, and let's call them speech cases for argument's sake, okay? They involve speech, at least as a genesis of the claim. I think what you're seeing is a judge's recognition that like, enough's enough. 
right? There's all this noise out there. We're going to start developing some law here. Interesting. I think we have to uh, for a lot of reasons. So. Enter Kelp. Very interesting. Thank Good you so much. You. Thanks Good for having me.